just a simple low-tech bicycle just to, for transportation, for hauling things around. Well, it's maybe the finest invention that humans have ever come up with. A little, ask any little kid, right? <laughs> They all love bikes, they, most little kids. That's how you get around. I'm working with kids at the after school program. Friday afternoons, we bring a truckload of bikes to this after school program and just turn, let the kids ride around. And uh, some of them come up to me, the first graders, second graders, they come up to me and they say, uh, I need training wheels. And I say, no, no, training wheels keep you from learning how to ride. They're, they're, it's not a good idea. So then they cry, which is awful. <laughs> so, so I started making, I made a bike with a sidecar. I made a bike that's two bikes that are side by side that are welded together. So you don't have to know how to balance. I don't know, and I, countless, I don't know how many kids we've introduced to this uh, thing where you can balance on two wheels. It's pretty amazing. Hi, I'm Chris Whiteout. Welcome to Living It, the podcast where we join experts in the experience of being human. Be bold. Say yes to adventure. Say yes to living it. Welcome to Living It with Chris Waddell. Today, I am with Mike Oxberger. Mike is a guy who completely fulfills our mission. Our mission is we want to talk to people who are experts in the experience of being human. And Mike, uh, back in the day, I think, and we, we were just talking about this before we went on, trying to figure out where exactly what the publication was, but you reached out to me I thought it was through the Hampshire Gazette, a, a, a newspaper in Western Mass. You said it was Outside Magazine, which makes it a little bit more glorious than, than just sort of the hometown newspaper. But I've been in, in some publication and you were working on an off-road hand cycle. And I sort of remember the conversation as being, hey, I have this idea of getting to the woods. Would you be interested in being a test pilot? Uh, so first, yeah. thank you for joining us. And then second, is that the way you remember it? Yeah, I, I remember calling. Well, I got your information from Outside Magazine. It was a whole page thing. It said something like, is this the world's greatest athlete because of both the winter and the summer Olympics? Right. That was why they labeled you that. And I thought I had been looking around for a disabled athlete to help me work on this hand cycle design. I couldn't do it without I just I couldn't do it by myself and uh, there you were in outside magazine and that said you lived right nearby in Massachusetts there so I called the way I remember is I called you up and I said you know my name's Mike I'm working on a new hand cycle design would you like to help and you said I'll be right there and you were and it was it was really helpful really you were the first disabled rider back way I didn't have the design down at all back then well, well, there wasn't really hardly any way to steer while you cranked at simultaneously back then. I mean, that's well, one of my favorite stories of all is the, when you're, you were in it and I, we knew that you needed some kind, cause you're leaning slightly forward and the riding position wasn't leaning back. It was slightly forward on your knees. And I, we knew you were gonna need a chest support to, especially someone who has a higher disability than you is gonna need a chest support. And because they would get tired so I had that there, but I had it held on with hose clamps onto the frame. And you were going around a corner, I guess, and it, the hose clamps weren't quite tight enough. So this chest support moved to the side a little bit. And I thought, wow, maybe we could steer with that, steer with your chest. And it was watching you with the loose hose clamps that brought that idea up. And that we've been doing that ever since. And everybody does that now. Now, this is the vehicle or this is the technology that I ended up using in climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. But you started way back. I mean, back in the back in the 80s, right? Thinking about this, like what was the what was the genesis of the thought of creating a hand cycle that could go off road? And 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 why did you why was yours unique? Well, it started with my introduction with Bob Hall. I was one of the owners of Merlin Metalworks with a titanium bike factory in Somerville. And Bob Hall was right down the road. He was a half a mile away. And he really liked us right away because we were working with titanium. And so he was really weight conscious, of course, being a 
racing wheelchair manufacturer. And Bob and the first the first official finisher of the Boston Marathon back yeah. in the day with, I mean, I think that was in like one of those 50 pound stainless steel hospital uh, yeah. chairs that was slightly yeah. modified. And I think he finished just under three hours because if he finished just under three hours, he got the official Boston Marathon t-shirt. And then he created a wheelchair company that built racing wheelchairs, everyday wheelchairs. And that's where you ended up meeting him was when, yeah. when he was with the building those chairs and you were down the road. Well, he came by one day with Jim Knob and they just, they wanted to be there in our factory because we were working with Titania and they, everybody really back then Titania was like the magic thing and everybody wanted to be around it. And so we, we, I, when, and then there was another guy came by with a, New England hand cycle, which is a, the very first brand of hand cycle. Before then, they were all clip on. They would clip on. This is a full on hand cycle, and and uh, it was tall, heavy, awkward thing. I mean, I, I shouldn't pick on it because he was the first one. But I thought right away. I thought if I were in a wheelchair, we were off road riders. We were off road mountain bike riders. You know, just natural. You want the knobby tires in. Riding on the road was boring, right? So we wanted to ride in the woods. And I thought if I were in a wheelchair, I would want two wheels in front, one in back, rear wheel drive. I don't want the recumbent riding position. I want to have a riding position where you can take your weight onto your arms if you need to, just the way we do on a bicycle, a regular bicycle. You know, you absorb the bumps with your arms, you move your weight around using your arms. And I wanted to have that for someone who was uh, in a hand cycle. And so that, but it took a long time before I finally got around to doing it. But the very first introduction was through Bob Hall. Interesting. And so the, the rear wheel actually improves the traction, right? So if it's rear wheel drive, as opposed to front wheel drive, where the road yeah. hand cycles oh, yeah. are front wheel drive, so there's no weight over it. And yeah, the New England hand cycle would just barely go up my dirt driveway where I live here. And the, the one-off hand cycle, I come flying down the road and coast right up the driveway because I'm going so fast. It, it's really different. It was, it was great fun to uh, provide so much extra off-road performance over the hand cycles that existed at the time. You, has, has the bike always been kind of a, a, a language for you? You know, it's, it's almost like a language of expression because, uh, I mean, some of your, what you did as a, as a bike rider was, was a lot of the problem solving as well, right? I mean, because didn't you start yeah. as, a, as a trials rider? Yeah, I like to think that the design was very much informed by uh, being a skilled rider. Uh, I had a friend who, who always would say that um, no athlete ever really made any difference in the advancement of civilization never and, and i would always say no that's i don't agree i mean generally he's right but you know you don't want to idolize some soccer player or just because you're really good at football that doesn't mean you're a good person but there is a place for um in engineering where the athlete can really improve things really help the the product and without, if it was just a bunch of engineers and no athletes, uh, bicycles would not be anywhere near as good as they are now. And, and so what did, what did being a trials rider, maybe explain what a trials rider is? Well, I did How it on motorcycles. Inform what you did. Yeah, I did it on motorcycles at first, before there were mountain bikes. You know, when I was a kid, there was no BMX and the only bicycles were big, heavy Schwinn's or <clears throat> things called English racers, you know, they didn't exist yet. So, so how did, how did being a trials rider inform oh, yeah. the way that you worked as an engineer? Well, at, at, like I said, I, I did it on motorcycles, motorcycle trials for many years. And then I moved to the city and sold all my motorcycles. And then I saw <clears throat> a ad for a Montessa bicycle, which this was before mountain bikes. This would be real early eighties, maybe 81. Yeah, 81. 
and Montesa was one of the brands of the, the Spanish brand that made trials motorcycles. And then, so they had this bicycle, I guess the guy, the owner of the company made it for his son. And, and I could see that the front sprocket and the back sprocket were both the same size. And that immediately caught my eye. I thought, wait a minute, that's gonna be a really low gear. You're gonna be able to climb in a way that I had never even thought that a bicycle could do. When I first saw that gearing, really caught my eye. And then I, then I researched more and I saw them riding over cars and doing all kinds of strange hopping things with the brakes locked. And I was totally in love from, the, from then. Well, we did bicycle trials on our big clunker Schwinn's before there were mountain bikes. We, we'd count the number of times you put your foot to the ground for balance. You know, that's how trials is scored. That's how you win is by not putting your feet to the ground. It's not a race and it's not timed. So it's just a test of skill over the worst possible terrain. And I love that part of it too, the uh, being the people that ride over the worst possible terrain, which is very appropriate to uh, wheelchairs and hand cycles because everywhere a wheelchair goes, it's impossible terrain. As soon as you're outdoors, it's really hard. And so it was a natural for me. And so what kind of obstacles did you start with when you and your friends were doing your your trials back in the day? Oh, logs, um, little hill climbs, uh, almost anything, mud, sand, snow. Um, we, didn't, we didn't do downhills very well because we only had a back brake. But uh, the, when I got the Montessa bicycle, then I had a front brake, which is then I've been in love with those ever since. Front brakes are so much fun. And that's the hand cycle does that well. The hand cycle, the two wheels in front, with the disc brake on each 20 inch wheel, you can go down really bad. I'm sure you're familiar with it. You can go down some really bad things and it's perfectly fine. I have a big hill that I use here at my house in Cummington here where I, people come for a test ride and I'll say, well, go ahead, you can go down that. And they would say, what? I'm not gonna go down that. But then once they start down and they realize that it has such powerful brakes, they can stop at any point. Then they relax and then they're fine. And then they pick up speed as they're going <laughs> down. I, I seem to remember you talking about, though, I mean, so there's the Bob Hall story, but I also remember you talking about when we were training that you had seen a news story on Afghanistan back in the yeah. day, back when the yeah. Russians were in Afghanistan back in the 80s. Yeah, that's right. It was, uh, I think it was 89 when Russia finally left Afghanistan. And they were really into landmines. And there was some kind, it was like a call for wheelchairs to be sent to Afghanistan. And I thought, they don't have curb cuts. They don't have vans that kneel down. In Afghanistan, they, that's, wheelchair isn't gonna be what they need. What they need is an off-road hand cycle. And so the first model that I made, I called it the Afghanistan model, thinking that that was the real need. The bigger cause was developing countries where people don't even have wheelchairs at all, let alone they don't have pavement or sidewalks or anything. And then, so the first one I made, I called it the Afghanistan model, but then in order to popularize it, in order to make more of them and try to promote the design, I had to switch gears and go for the rich white recreation market, market you know, like the, <laughs> where that's where in the bike, that's why I did in the bicycle industry, selling really, really expensive titanium bike frames to make a living and it's, that's where the money is and that's how you can continue to do it. That's how I can afford to do the research is by getting uh, customers who have lots of money who will pay for this uh, as, as a recreational thing rather than some, some person in Afghanistan who needs it just to get to the store or just to go home. Well, and it was a lot of research too, right? It wasn't just, it wasn't just this, this idea that you had in your mind, your mind, it was grounded in 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 history really right yeah there was a lot of it was a year of of full-time working on it before i had one that i would sell um i i spent well we would commute it my shop was uh, a half an hour away for a while there and it was a big long downhill between my house and my shop i mean it was like a two mile long downhill and i would put the whatever prototype i was working on in the back of our car and stop at the top of the downhill and 
my wife would drive the car and I would ride this hand cycle down this dirt road. Did that almost every day for a long time. And so that's, that was the big research was trying to get the high speed stability down. The climbing traction and the cornering was okay, but it was the high speed where three-wheeled vehicles are really hard to control at high speed. The two-wheeled vehicle will hold itself up. I mean, you can't hardly fall off. If you're going 50 miles an hour down on a bicycle, you can't even hardly fall off the thing. It's self-stabilizing. But with more than two wheels, it really wants to tip over. And it's really it can be very dangerous and scary. And so that was one of my most, uh, I'm most proud of the high speed stability, but it wasn't obvious at first at all how to get that. That has to do with hand grip placement and making sure that your the force of your hands on the hand handlebars tend to make the thing go straight. I stole that from John Castellano with the uh, was his name of his uh, Cobra, you know, uh, John Davis, right? And uh, cast the, that he called it Rider Trail, and he was so right about that that. Then I, I still, to this day, I think my hand cycle design is more stable at high speed than any of the recumbent leg powered trikes or more stable than any of those. They all have the handlebars where it's too twitchy and you're going 20 miles an hour and up. It just becomes terrifying. You, you one, one little bump and you, you generate steering through your hands, you unwanted steering. Whereas my hand cycle design when you're going 20 miles an hour, it's, it's kind of hard to turn. When you're, when you're going really slow, it's, you make it hard to turn. It has to be hard to turn at low speed in order to be safe at high speed. But that took a long time to get that right. So you talked a little bit about the, the steering with the chest, but then you're also talking now about steering with the handlebars. Can you describe yeah. the two different ways of steering the hand cycle? Yeah, that was where you were the first person who was actually disabled to, so I could see that it could be done. You have to move your hands from the handlebars to the cranks. You know, the goal was the Pikes Peak uphill dirt road hill climb with switchback turns where you need all the power you can possibly get, but you have to steer at the same time. And so the downhills are simple. You just put your hands on the handlebars where the brake levers are, and that's fine. The hard part was can someone who's disabled move their hands from the handlebars to the cranks and back and forth. Does that work okay? And uh, you were the first person I saw do it. <laughs> that, was, that was nice. I was, I was clapping. I was saying, look at that. He did it. And then I said, I remember saying you, when you did it, when you were actually steering with the chest, steering around in a big curve, it was really not very maneuverable yet, but you were cranking and turning at the same time. And I said, look, there it is. <laughs> And one of the differences as well versus the ones that are on the road, where the run, ones that are on the road, you're steering and you're pedaling is, is with the same with the pedals, right? So you're pedaling yeah. and they're together. Where, but you decided, why did you decide to go with an opposing, uh, opposing pedals like we have on, on regular bikes, traditional bikes? Yeah, well, that's another thing that's different about my hand cycle design was that yeah the opposed cranks um well if you imagine if you're stopped if you're at a dead stop and you want to start having the opposed cranks is way more powerful than i mean it, it it's it's really complex and i i i still haven't i don't have don't pretend to have it all dialed in but the road going ones you know they get some really good cadence out of that and, and there's a tremendous amount of power when your hands are right in by your chest and you're pulling up with your back muscles and lift. That's a huge amount of power right there, maybe even more than in the opposed position. But there's no dead spot. With the, with the cranks together, there's a great big dead spot where your hands are away from you and you don't have any power pushing down. And so that's not going to be good at two miles an hour on a really steep off-road climb. You, you got to have the opposed cranks for the, the really low RPM power. And, and that's the thing, too, is that when you are climbing, because I think for a long time, I didn't have I didn't have a cycle computer on my off road. 
So I didn't know how fast I was going. I just knew that when I stopped pedaling, I stopped. <laughs> there was there was there was no glide as I was going uphill. You think, okay, yeah. I'm gonna take a little break now, and I'm going to I'm going to relax, and then I'm going to keep going. Because I mean, I tell this to people all the time, like like Kilimanjaro. When I was flying, when I was going as fast as I possibly could, I was going two and a half miles an hour uphill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it really is. It, it it's a it's a different sport, but it's also there are so many different problems to solve along the way. I mean, just how to like little rocks, little roots, different things like that become become fairly major obstacles. And, yeah. and it's probably more similar. I felt like it, in a lot of ways, it was more analogous to rock climbing than it was yeah. to, to cycling in that you're kind of looking and going, okay, I've got to pick this route. And if I go there, then I'm going to be okay. But if I get, you know, if I get to that part, then I'm, then I'm stuck out on an island and I have to figure out how to go, how to go back. So it, in some ways it's back to your, back to your trials. Uh, yeah. Riding yeah the trials riders are comfortable going one mile an hour. It's perfectly fine. The world champion can, and they come to a stop sometimes too. And that's perfectly fine. It's not, it doesn't penalize you. It's, it's, it's a tool that you use to read the terrain and it's okay to go any, it doesn't matter how fast you go. It's, it's you know, how many times you put your foot to the ground for balance. So I worked on that. I worked on actual trials the first time in uh, Crested Butte. I wanted to have a, cause there's British sport. It's called car trials where that's there. The British do crazy things with motorized vehicles all the time. And so one of them is that, and, and I wanted to, come up with rules so we could have a off-road hand cycle trials event where it's obviously it's not going to be scored according to how many times you put your feet down that's not going right. to happen. but i came up with a whole set of rules based on uh, british car trials for that and it, it, trials riders are fine going one mile an hour that's perfectly okay it's but a lot of the inspiration from you for you to build this came from cars and came from motorcycles and came from different vehicles that preceded this vehicle. Was that always intriguing for you, sort of the history and how people have solved problems throughout and the challenges they put in front of themselves? Oh, yeah. I love the the history of motorized vehicles, history of motorcycle. I'm a big fan of uh, his motorcycle history, for sure. I, because I remember you talking about, and, and I'd never even really heard of it, that the part of the reason for going with two wheels in front versus two wheels in back on the on the three-wheeled hand cycle came from came from cars, right? Because there were three-wheeled yeah. cars. And we don't really, we don't associate, I mean, we don't associate three wheels with cars at all. Yeah, there's there's a, a long history of three-wheeled, hundred years history of three-wheeled cars. And they really clearly separate into the high performance ones with two wheels in front and then the Shriner circus ones with two wheels in back. You know, they're, they're, if you're gonna really, if, if you're gonna just imagine going down a steep hill, breaking hard and turning at the same time, you gotta have the two wheels in front. You know, the one wheel in front with a brake on it is just a recipe for flipping over if you're turning and braking at the same time. And not, not to mention, like you said before, about the uphill climbing traction. Again, you want the, the, the drive wheel in the back. As soon as you start going uphill, then you know, the front wheel, front wheel drive hand cycles are particularly bad at, uh, I mean, sometimes if it's raining, I've seen road going hand cycle races where it, the road was wet and slippery and they had trouble even gripping, even on pavement, they had trouble gripping. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Now, how did that, so, so some of the history of it is that you, you left Merlin and then you were building your own custom mountain bikes, right? right? Titanium mountain bikes. Is that yeah, how that just, worked? Yeah, titanium bike frames of any sort. Yeah. And, but the sort of bikes that you were building were far from traditional still. Well, it was, yeah, people would come to me for the weird things that they couldn't get. 
I ended up making lots of different copies of, you know, I made a titanium, uh, one bike brand was a slingshot and somebody wanted, they had, they really liked their slingshot bike, but they wanted it to be lighter. So they hired me to make one in titanium and the titanium molten, uh, titanium uh, proflex and lots of different ones. A lot of times it would be just really eccentric customers who just wanted something very strange that no one else would make. So that was, that was my, that was the funnest thing was not to just keep making the same bike over and over again, but that's why I called the company one off. Yeah. I remember uh, you had a, you, you had a suspension that was based on the inner tube of like a football. Yeah. That right. Yeah. Yeah. It was a real early uh, rear suspension design that uh, my friend Trimble, Rue Trimble came up with and, we made a couple of those in titanium too. Yeah, it was a, the spring was the bladder from a toy football and it was in tension rather than uh, compressing a spring. You, you pull on the tips of the football, if you will. And that was the spring, which was, it was a brilliant idea. I mean, suspension has gotten way better since then, but at the time it was a pretty good bike. And, and that led you then to to the one-off hand cycle but then now you're building all sorts of bikes and i guess the the first question is why bikes why why do people need bikes and why do they need different kinds of bikes well it's maybe the finest invention that humans have ever come up with is uh just a simple low-tech bicycle just to, for transportation for hauling things around um, I, I've always, I mean, little, ask any little kid, right? <laughs> they all love bikes it, it, without fail. I mean, I guess maybe Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, he, he's afraid of his bike. It's, he sees it as a monster, and, but that's pretty rare. Normally kids really go for it. And so, yeah, that was, like you said, that was my vocabulary. And I, most little kids, that's how you get around. That's how you go meet your friends. And uh, so that's where I'm going now is I'm working with kids at a, maybe I think you saw the video, the after school program. And uh, I keep getting these kids that come up to me. We, we bring Friday afternoons, we bring a truckload of bikes to this after school program and just turn, let the kids ride around. And uh, some of them come up to me, the first graders, second graders, they come up to me and they say, uh, I need training wheels. And I say, no, no, training wheels keep you from learning how to ride. That there, it's not a good idea. So then they cry, which is awful. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I started making, I made a bike with a sidecar. And I made a, a bike that's two bikes that are side by side that are welded together. So you don't have to know how to balance. You can take your friend for, you can have two people on the bike and they, and then I made two different tandems. I made a 16 inch wheeled and a 20 inch wheeled tandem. So that's good if you don't know how to ride and get on the back. And uh, then we have these recumbent trikes that are leg powered. I just buy those, but those are really popular for the kids who don't know how to ride yet. But then eventually, you know, you get them on a little bike, you take the pedals off and they paddle around with their feet and then they start holding their feet up in the air and they, I don't know, and I countless, I don't know how many kids we've, you know, introduced to this, uh, Thing where you can balance on two wheels it's pretty amazing and then you take it even further right i mean you have a bike that's hinged in the in the middle where the frame is hinged and <laughs> some of the old time bikes with like the big front wheel and the little back yeah. wheel and yeah yeah i well i have a nice shop where i can make any kind of bike i think up i can make them no problem at all so i made an 1860s bike and Back in 1860, if you were a serious cyclist, the bike that you rode had the cranks fastened to the front axle and there was no chain and it was front wheel drive and the handlebars and the cranks and the front wheel all moved together. So whenever you pedaled hard, it made it turn a little bit and they were awful, but that was what serious cyclists rode back then. And then that led to the introduction of the high wheeler, the penny farthing, because as soon as you start riding with a bunch of people, there's going to be a race and you want to go as fast as you possibly can. And the way to go faster is to make the front wheel bigger. 
there weren't any gears, there's no chains that you just had to make the front, but there's no reason to make the back wheel bigger. So that's where you see the ones with a huge front wheel and little tiny back wheels. I made one of those too for the little kids. I had to actually have the little peg so they could get on. It's a 20 inch wheel in the front and a roller blade wheel in the back. But the kids are so small, they couldn't hardly get on it. So I had to make a little peg, which is what adults use to get on one of these giant penny farthing bikes. Dangerous thing, I had one little kid threaten to sue me. So. <laughs> Fell over, landed on his face, which you always do on those penny far things. And <laughs> he, was a, he was a good friend. He didn't really mean it. <laughs> and then the, the, the other one you mentioned was the hinge in the middle. That's a Schwinn swing bike. It, Schwinn sold those for a while. And it's got the weirdest, it has the headset is a pivot, but then there's also a pivot on the seat post. And it, it's, it's not good for anything, really, just for laughs. <laughs> and so it almost gets to be parallel, right? Where the back wheel is parallel with the front wheel. When yeah. It's turning, right? Yeah. If you can contort your body enough, you can actually do that with the, get the two wheels almost side by side as you're riding along. <laughs> kind of twists you in two when you do it. But. Now, what do these kids think about? think about these these bikes and these sort of different configurations because it's you know a bike is sort of a bike right you have a mountain bike you have a road bike whatever but then these are bikes that nobody else has well that's the fun part is we I, I tend to not uh say much I'll just bring the bikes to the after school program in our trailer and I'll just take them out of the trailer and set them down and the kids run over and start riding them you know, they, it's, it's not a very verbal thing. They just, they should, they sure do beat on them though. And they, they love it. They, so some of them we call the fight bikes because they like them so much. They always fight over them, but we have to sort of regulate, you know, make them take turns. You know, some of them, they're so much fun. Which, which bikes are the most popular? Well, the, it's the recumbent leg powered trikes that are the ones that are the fight bikes. Really? These little tiny, uh, the 12 inch wheels in the front and a 16 inch wheel in the back. And the, it's like this little, you're, you're right on the ground. You're laying almost right on the ground, flat on your back almost. And your feet are way out in front. There, there's a lot of those for adults, uh, recumbent, they call them tadpole trikes because they're two wheels in front, one in back. And uh, we got, three of those that are little tiny ones and the kids just love it it's like a little pedal powered sports car except they're really slow they're terrible on the bike path they're not good at high speed they're way too twitchy at high speed but as long as it's just grass or a dirt parking lot or something that's flat they it's pretty fun what's the what's the reaction from these kids so this is an after school program and you know, I mean, it's, it, our, our world has changed, hasn't it? I mean, kids are, kids are consumed by, by electronics and things like that. And bicycles in some ways are, you know, reminiscent of a, of a bygone era, but, but you're kind of bringing it back. So what's, what's their reaction to, to these bikes? Well, most of the kids, like I said, most of the kids just love it. And they, they race out of the building and run over and grab whatever bike they can and they just love it but some of them don't some of them are a little more timid that's why i have the other bikes that we don't even have to balance you can take your friend for a ride on the sidecar or something so some of them are really mellow but the reaction is just like you'd expect from kids they just i think you're right though that they're not getting exercise as much as they should as much as i think i did when i was that age you know i they're they're so entertained by the modern you know computers and cell phones and all that that they don't get the exercise that they probably really should and and this is part of a bigger it's part of a bigger initiative isn't it for you i mean the bikes the after school bikes but but trying to to live in concert with with the environment and 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 reusing recycling things yeah. is this what what brought on that initiative and what what are you trying to to affect well the latest version of it is that we, we are fortunate enough to have this large um, empty mill building 
in the town of Adams, Massachusetts. <clears throat> and we advertise that we will take donations and people give us bikes. They give us a lot. We have a couple hundred bikes there that have been just donated. And another thing that we do in the mill building along the lines of reuse and recycling is we take, um, there's a linens rental place that's right down the road where they rent sheets to hotels and hospitals and schools. And I mean, you probably never thought about it, but if you, you, know, if you go to a hotel, if the hotel doesn't have a, a good washing machine or washing laundry facilities, they, they got to get the sheets washed each time. And so that's what this place does. And as soon as the sheets are slightly worn or not perfect, they've been throwing them out. And they, for 25 years, they've thrown out about six tons of sheets per year, this one laundry facility, and it's right next door to our building. So we're walking by their dumpster and it's seeing their dumps are overflowing with perfectly good looking sheets. So we told them, don't do that, bring the sheets to us. So, cause we have this big empty building. So we've been doing that for a long time now. And we give them to homeless shelters and the survival center and church groups. And we've been distributing these sheets. Well, the, where I'm going with that is one of our, a woman from the Congo who sends shipping containers back to her home village full with all kinds of stuff that they don't have in the Congo, but we have, every, we have tons of here. So she fills up these shipping containers and she had heard about these sheets. And so we were happy to give her a whole car load of free linens, sheets, tablecloths, uh, pillowcases, all kinds of things. And she's walking through our building and she sees all these bikes. And she said, well, how much is that? The little kids bikes, she really were interested in the little kids bikes to send back to her village in the Congo. And I said, well, if you're sending them to Africa, these bikes are free. That's great. So, you know, I didn't pay anything, but I just fixed them up, you know, clean them up, fix the flats and make sure they work okay. And then she saw one of our bikes that had a rack on the back. And she said, you know, in my village, that rack would be used for carrying people, but it's not that strong. The racks that we use are super light aluminum and there's just two four millimeter bolts that it's not strong enough for a person. So I made sturdy racks. And so I put, so she took um, 26 bikes about a month ago now into the shipping container and they all had really sturdy racks I made out of plywood. So that's plenty sturdy enough for a person to sit on and be carried around. So they carry their firewood and water and charcoal and all kinds of things on these. Uh, we haven't gotten any photos back yet. It hasn't gotten, it takes a long time for the shipping container to get there, but we're looking forward to the photos of, uh, cause we have all these little kids bikes that the most common donation that you'll get if you take bikes for donation, it's gonna be little kids bikes. And uh, so I put racks on some of those even. There's four of them that are 16 inch wheel bikes with a plywood rack on the back that's sturdy enough to carry your friend on. So I can't wait to get photos back from there of these bikes being used. And I, that's something I'm really enthused about. I'm gonna hopefully do this for a long time now is uh, improve the safety and the quality of utilitarian bikes in a really low tech way. Cause you, you, I'm sure you've seen photos of people with you know, the whole family on a bike. My record is seven people on one little motorcycle. I collect photos of this or, or huge loads of bricks or amazing things they get on their bike and they tend to walk beside it. If it's so loaded, you can't even ride it. You just walk beside it. And I wanna work on making that better. It's a place for your feet that's safe so you don't get your foot in the spokes, um, place to hang on, uh, center stand, to hold the bike up while you load it. There's a lot of research there that I'm really looking forward to going further with uh, utilitarian bikes for developing countries that are easy to build, that are low tech. I make videos that then will help them copy what I've done. Well, a lot of that, it, for people who haven't been to developing countries, the bike is often the primary source of transportation in a lot of places and, and it's transportation for everything. It's okay, you have to move a refrigerator. We're gonna put a refrigerator on the bike yeah. and we're going yeah. to move the refrigerator because that's what we have. And maybe there are two or three of us. And like you said, there's a family and there's somebody sitting on the, 
on the handlebars and there are people on the back and 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 it is it's mind blowing and it, but it is it is the independence i saw that just when we were in tanzania for the climb people who had bikes had the had the independence of being able and granted there there are definitely people who have cars and trucks and and those kinds of things but as soon as you get further out of the cities it really is the bikes and and the quality of the bike they had this this chinese made bike that that looked like it was sort of like a three speed kind of thing that you're trying to ride on the dirt yeah. and in the sand yeah the chinese mm -hmm. made a big effort they made there's a flying pigeon as one brand another one is phoenix and for some reason i don't know why but they made these frames really huge there if you're not 510 511 you can't even straddle the thing i don't know why they made these frames so big but I have a whole collection of photos. I'll, I'll get you some of these photos of little kids that are way too small to ride the bike. And they, the top tube is going right beside their shoulder and they have their arm around the saddle and they're steering with one hand. And oh, they, you know, the kids really want to get on a bike and they'll figure out some way to ride it, even though it's way too big for them. I have some other photos. I'll get, I'll get you one photo where um, our friend from Africa, from the Congo gave us this one where it's a woman She's got one kid on the front rack and another kid on the back rack, another kid on her back. And there's also a load of firewood on the back rack. And she has this great big basket balanced on the top of her head while she's riding this bike. You gotta be really strong. Oh, and very skilled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, skilled and strong to be able to, to keep the bike moving and keep it upright. Yeah, but the, I said to the woman who gave me the photo from the Congo, she said, I said, come on, that must have been staged just for the photo, right? And she said, no, no, that's how they do it. And that woman is, she said, and that woman is very happy because she has a bike. You know, she's taking her three kids and a load of firewood and who knows what's on her head. She gets to carry that stuff with her. And how would she even do it without the bike? What made you kind of take take a step back in some ways to to address some of these problems i mean some of these uh you know like kids maybe not riding their bikes as much as as they did in our generation uh giving them access to, to bikes and and to fun really to to looking at at the african group and 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 in some ways in some ways from my viewpoint it seems like you're you're, you're attempting to simplify a, a a complex world uh it, it, does that sound like an accurate assessment and and if so why why have you why have you why have you turned your eye in that direction well bikes are pretty simple i mean the the democratic republic of congo is famous for uh, their the capital has actually has a full size a great big bronze sculpture of one of these things called, uh, I always get the pronunciation wrong, but it's a kukudu, something like that, where it's all made out of wood. The whole bike is made out of wood. It doesn't have any cranks. You, you, know, you run beside it or you jump on it and you ride on it on the downhills. And it, it's a very celebrated thing in the Democratic Republic of Congo where they make these. People, they cost about $100, I guess, to get someone to make one for you. And it could hardly be simpler. There's no ball bearings. The, the bearings are just wood against wood with some grease. And uh, so at that level, it's like a, almost like a, a caveman sort of bike. You know, it, it really, you really could have made one of these with just a hatchet and, and a couple of trees. So the, the bicycles are just quite simple at that level. And I, that's, it's appealing. Well, that's the beauty of it too, right? I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like when we get into our car, we expect to turn the key and the car will, will move, right? I mean, it's kind of that same sort of thinking with a bike where if we have a bike, we want to get on it and we want to ride. We don't want to spend all of our time tuning the bike to make sure that it can ride. So to achieve this sense of, uh, of simplicity, makes it far more utilitarian, doesn't it? Yeah, the bikes that we send to the Congo are generally, it's much better if they don't have any cables at all. The, 
it's a it's when you pedal backwards for your brake, and that's called a coaster brake. And we were looking for that. And, but most of the bikes that we get donated have front and rear brake cables and two derailleur cables, which means that after a few months, probably, we don't know for sure, but it, probably in Africa, after a few months, there's going to have no brakes and it's going to be stuck in the wrong gear. So we're always looking around for adult coaster brake bikes, like a beach cruiser sort of thing. And in, so at, at that level, the simplicity is really important because of the maintenance is hard. They don't have cables. They, we, we just, we don't have enough of those bikes with the adult sized bikes with the coaster brake. We're really looking for those all the time. And so you're looking for those to get donated. You're not actually building a, a coaster brake or anything. No. No, there's, I got plenty of bike frames. <laughs> no problem with the, the basic, the wheels and the frame. It's the, the low tech coaster brake thing that's rare. Those are even actually hard to buy. You know, the, you can't buy them at a bike shop. Bike shops, American bike shops are really only, they don't even like you unless you're buying a racing bike. Americans only buy racing bikes. Hardly ever do they, say, well, I need a bigger rack or where's the fenders or, you know, they, they don't, Americans don't do that. The rest of the world does a lot more than we do. Do you celebrate some of these communities? Like you did, you did the world championships, the off-road hand cycle world championships in Crested Butte. And that's a place that the kind of where, where the bike is king, right? It's, it's, yeah. is it 14 miles an hour, I think in town uh, for driving? I think it's, yeah. It's yeah. something like that. It's 12 or 14 miles an hour or something. Not right. 15, but, but 14. It's strangely slow. Yeah, well, this little girl got killed there many years ago, and they've been strict about that ever since. Yeah, everybody has their, everybody in town has their town bike, and nobody, ha you don't have to lock them. I've seen television ads in Trust Butte, like, somebody took my town bike. Please bring it back. That was my favorite one. So, so yeah, Crested Butte is good for that. It's great. You see these bike racks out in, in people's yards or whatever, and you see all the all the different bikes and they do they do a big downhill that was around the same time as the world championships that we did. I, I assume it was when you were there as well, because you and I weren't there the same year and, and they do it coming off the pass and everybody's you, you, everybody's in their in their crazy bike and their crazy costume. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. So how do we how do we bring the bike back in in sort of in sort of more than just a you know more more than just a a workout more than just a you know the the, the bike back in in its sort of simple transportation form boy i don't know i wish i knew unfortunately it looks like we're going to electric assist that's everybody wants that now and i can't get behind that I mean, it's good if it means somebody rides a bike where before they couldn't, or they absolutely wouldn't ride a bike. But I think we're being overrun with our, our bike paths. Or, I mean, I just got back from visiting my parents in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. There's these electric scooters that are all over the place. And they're, they're a menace. <laughs> and then they don't have the system down for returning them. There's no docking place to so that people when you're done with it they just leave it on the side of the road and so i can't get behind uh, electric bikes but that i'm afraid that's where we're going it i don't see bikes gaining in popularity really at all um there's always this niche of people who like it and who spend a lot of money on it but uh my people americans just use their car these they're not even cars nowadays they use their truck the great big pickup truck to do everything go to the store whatever they use it for everything and when they could be using a bike you might be you might be changing a bit of a of a generation right with these kids who are coming i, I that's not my goal I, I don't have any hope for that for getting americans to use bikes more frequently uh, that's and i don't see that happening at all i love what you've been able to do with with the hand cycle that to me as somebody in a wheelchair, my workouts oftentimes when I was able-bodied were, were running on trails or riding on trails. And it seemed like that world was closed to me. 
and to be able to, to get on an off-road hand cycle and, and get out to those places and go out for, for a ride and be out in, in nature and not worried about somebody running you over on the side of the road or whatever, that to me was a complete game changer, was, was something that, that changed my world. And I think, I think there are a fair number of people, and that's actually probably one of the ones where, where the electric assist is, is beneficial because yeah. it, is, it is really challenging to, to go uphill. It just takes a long. You sure? Thing. What's that? You sure? I've heard that. Yeah. It, it, you shouldn't, it you shouldn't pick such a huge hill. I mean, come on, Kilimanjaro. Got to be kidding. It, it's <laughs> funny, and what's what's funny about that for me is that it was so different than what I did as a wheelchair racer, where wheelchair racing is is so ballistic. I was just talking with, with one of the coaches, one of the, one of the foremost coaches yesterday. And he was saying it really is analogous to like a, uh, to endurance boxing. You know, this is, this is what wheelchair <laughs> racing is, is, a, is endurance boxing. And, <laughs> and so, so, you know, it's, it's kind of, you are, you, you are, it's ballistic. You're, you're, you're going kind of as hard as you can to try to keep going. Whereas, when I was climbing Kilimanjaro, the objective had to change completely. I would I had to turn into an engine, and, and and it was all about RPMs. And it was just it didn't matter what gear I was in. I just had to maintain RPMs because then I could roll over things. Whereas if I had to stop and sort of figure out how I could get up and over this log or up and over this rock then it, en it enlisted all the muscles and the yeah. muscles are the things that can really get tired when you tax them as opposed to your sort of cardiovascular system. So I had to turn it into the cardiovascular system. And, and it was, I, I actually did, I did some arm measurements because I was getting some compression clothing and they wanted my arm measurements. And for some reason like this, you know, tight clothing that, that helps you, helps helps continue to move the blood and and clear out the lactic acid and all this stuff and everything and, and i did it and my arms were an inch smaller in circumference than they were when i was when i was racing wheelchairs yeah that's interesting <laughs> so the heart and lungs were probably better though right lungs were better lungs were better and they kind of needed to be i guess when you're going to nineteen thousand feet and 48 percent of the oxygen at sea level <laughs> You really did need to do that, but but yeah, it was uh, it, it, it's it's an entirely different sport, and I think in in a lot of ways that's the that's the cool part is it brings you someplace and and it finds and you find a way to 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 look at things from a different perspective, which in, in which in a lot of ways seems like what you are what you're doing uh, with both with your businesses and and with with the kids and the different bikes is like. Kind of just changing that perspective a little bit, uh, Mike. It has been tremendous to get to reconnect with you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. See you later. Thank you for joining us. Please subscribe to Chris White Living It for more stories on the adaptive community, the Paralympics, artists, athletes, entrepreneurs, experts in the experience of being human. Also follow us on Spotify, Apple, Facebook, and Instagram. I look forward to seeing you next week.